But now others in the online network had got much closer to unleashing mass slaughter. Mirsad Bektasevich was just 18 years old. His dream was to open and run his own Al-Qaeda franchise. Bektasevich was forming a small terrorist cell in his hometown, Sarajevo. Just like Harris Ahmed in America, he was looking for a way to turn internet fantasies into bloody reality. This is one of the big limiting factors. You're talking about guys that are 17, 18, 19 years old, you know. Sure, they can express a willingness to blow themselves up, and sure, they can talk about Al-Qaeda, and sure, they can access Al-Qaeda media, but where are the bombs? Where are the explosives? You know, otherwise, this is all tough talk. But Bektasevich was different. Bektasevich had a means to get explosives. One of the things that makes the Sarajevo cell different from most of the other Al-Qaeda-related cells is that it didn't have to rely on homemade explosives. And that was because all around here, in the woods and the mountains, there were plenty of ready-made explosives that had been left over as a result of the war. Try to see if we can have more money, because I have, dear brother, praise to God, found some really good things, you know. These good things were guns and explosives sold to him by a man who worked in this halal chicken restaurant. But Tarsevich was almost ready to act. But first he wanted to let the world know that he meant business. He trekked miles into the hills outside the city to a remote cottage where he narrated this chilling video. Allah Akbar. Here the brothers are preparing for the attacks. Just 18 years old, but in possession of an incredible arsenal of guns and explosives. This weapon is going to be used against Europe, against those who has have their forces in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But unknown to Bektasevich, the police were onto him. And just a few days after he recorded this video, they made their move. Bektasevich and his accomplices were arrested at his aunt's house in a Sarajevo suburb. When the police raided the apartment at number 71, they found inside almost 20 kilograms of ready-made explosives, consisting of nitroglycerine, TNT, and ammonium nitrate. They also found a bag and inside the bag was a suicide belt already made up with three sticks of explosives. Bektasevich was one man within a larger network and you know you start looking at Bektasevich and suddenly you realize how big this network is. The sheer extent of the network became clear when police discovered Bektasevich was discussing terror attacks with someone who was living much closer to home. British police look at Bektasevich's phone records and they realize, hold on a second, he's getting phone calls from London, from the UK. This is not about email, this is not about websites. This guy's getting phone calls from somebody in the UK. So, who was this mystery caller? What were his connections with Bektasevich and what was he up to? At the time, nobody had a clue. Detectives traced the phone call to this house in Shepherd's Bush in West London. The police didn't know it, but they were on the brink of an unexpected breakthrough. The caller was a close associate of Abid Khan. The security services knew him only by his online nickname, Terrorist007. 007 was a seminal figure in the online growth of Generation Jihad. He was someone who demonstrated to the world of Generation Jihad, this young group of people arising, that it was possible to use technology, use the internet, use these social networking forms to burst through the glass ceiling of it's just the internet, it's just the web, and then move into the world of real jihad, real terrorism. 
Terrace 007 was 22 years old, but like Abid Khan, his fascination with violent extremism had begun much earlier. As a teenager, he developed a twin obsession with computers and Al-Qaeda's ideology. Central Europe, however, is, is really the heartland of jihadi activity outside of... Aaron Weisberg is a terrorism consultant and a tracker of online jihadis. Through sheer persistence and know-how, he would become the nemesis of terrorist 007. Well, initially, he was nothing more than a fanboy. He simply supported Al-Qaeda. He wanted to help, and he tried to volunteer himself. Uh, as circumstances al arose, he found ways to actually be quite a significant help uh, to the media operations of Al-Qaeda. And what was he doing? How was he helping them? When people had videotapes, for example, Zarqawi killed the American Nick Berg. The video of the beheading was uh, ver a very large file. It was not the kind of thing you could share effectively through email. And. Uh, there were really very few public services available to handle files of that size. So, your Hobby 007's mission was to break into, to steal access, to hijack other people's computers on the internet, and then use those hijacked computers uh, in order to upload and, and share videos from Al Qaeda in Iraq. Terrorist 007 had become an online celebrity. He confirmed his reputation by building the official website of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And all done from a bedroom in West London. Yeah, but that's not it, though. I mean, there is evidence on his computer. Never mind Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He was doing web work for Al-Qaeda Central, Asahab Media Foundation, Osama bin Laden's mouthpiece. He reached that level. The hunt was on for terrorist 007. Every time he went online, his enemy in the ether, Aaron Weisberg, was watching him, waiting for him to trip up. And 007 wasn't happy about it. Well, your hobby 007 was famous for asking online. Uh, he said if I was killed, all he wanted was one of my fingers as a souvenir. You know, like to be cut off my hand so he could have it and keep it in the freezer or something. Um, it takes all kinds. Despite the threats, Aaron Weisberg tracked him down to West London. We did this by applying pressure to him. If what he wanted to do was publish things on the internet, uh, we would have what he published removed from the internet, not in order to silence him, but to make him more active. Um, the busier he was, the more active we made him, the more likely it was that he was going to make a mistake. Eventually, he did make that mistake. Aaron Weisberg lured him into an online trap. By analyzing what 007 put on the net, Weisberg traced his location and tipped off the police. The security services had other priorities at the time, and terrorist 007 slipped through the net. It wasn't until 18 months later, following the tip-off from Sarajevo, that the police swooped on this house in Shepherd's Bush. Officers who raided it had been briefed that they were looking for a man by the name of Yunus Tsuli. They had a name, but that was all. Yunus Tsuli, as it turned out, was the real name of terrorist 007. One of Al-Qaeda's most obsessive propagandists was now behind bars. It's a very dark world. It's like they suffer from a kind of uh, self-inflicted post-traumatic stress disorder. They expose themselves to violence and to visual portrayals of violence. The effect that it has is, is that they become increasingly desensitized uh, and increasingly inclined to try and perpetrate violence on their own. But just how did terrorist 007 fit in with the rest of this network?